All right. So we're looking at lesson four, American mobilizing for war. We have a picture of the attack on Pearl Harbor. This is the USS Shaw under attack, Pearl Harbor, on, on the early morning of December 7th, 1941. As I mentioned before, this is sort of where we'll end this lesson, but I will be going more in depth on the attack on Pearl Harbor. Same deal, I've got, I'm gonna touch on the Battle of Britain in this particular lesson, but I'm not getting in, in depth into it until later. So the early refugees from the Crystal Knock, the Night of Broken Glass, the beginning, not the beginning of the Jewish pogrom, but the most widely viewed globally from news reports and film footage and pictures and the like. Crystal Knock, the Night of Broken Glass, November 9th, over the night of the 9th, the, the 10th of 1938. It was prompted by the assassination of the German diplomat Ernest von Rath by a young Polish Jewish teenager, Herschel Grunspan, in Paris on November 7th. A guy that pushes for this is Joseph Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda, and Jewish synagogues. Over a thousand are destroyed. Businesses, homes are burnt, bombed, and destroyed. Mass book burnings, those have been going on since as, as early as 33 and 34. At least 91 Jews were killed, that can be confirmed. The number is probably much higher. And the people that launched these attacks were the SA paramilitary and then just German citizens in the streets. 30,000 Jewish men were rounded up into concentration camps, and the events are widely publicized all over the world. Time Magazine, remember we talked about Henry Luce, they pick up the story. Life runs it, he runs both of those periodicals. A lot of Jews try to escape to neighboring European countries in the West. Obviously, this is that period of time. It's like in between the time of, of the invasion of an occupation of Czechoslovakia, the Sudetenland, and the invasion of Poland. So, a number of notable Jewish refugees come to America. Albert Einstein, he had visited the United States in the early 20s, and now he's going to make his way back. Brilliant physicist and mathematician. He's a member of the Manhattan Project. He arrives in 1930 and doesn't go back to, to Europe, doesn't go back to Germany. Einstein was involved in the works of the International Committee on Intellectual Cooperation of the League of Nations in Geneva and a number of other high-ranking scientists, researchers, teachers, artists, intellectuals make their way to the United States. I'm sure you've heard in the news recently the Einstein visa has been popping up in the news. That's a newer law. The Einstein visa was proposed and passed in the 90s. Like early 1990s. Um, we can talk about that later. The vast majority of the Jews were not admitted into the U United States. Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau, who was Jewish, was outraged. Remember, we talked a bit about the Immigration Restriction Acts that had been passed in 1921, 1924. We call those also the What Acts. It starts with a Q. Nope. No, wrong thing. I don't know. Think 3%. Only 3% of the nation, that quota. European nation's population. Very good. Could immigrate. The quota acts, right? Why were those established in the first place in the post World War I era? What type of Or the fear of what type of immigration? Communists. Very good. That's our first red scare. Very good. Awesome job. All right, so most of these Jewish 
refugees are turned away and they fall right back into the hands of the Nazis in Western Europe. So here we have a burning synagogue on the top left, in the events of Kristallnacht. These are the cities in which Kristallnacht was launched. This is Joseph Goebbels, the minister of propaganda for Nazi Germany. Here are Jewish males being rounded up. They've got the Star of David in front of them. Jewish businesses burned. Another synagogue completely destroyed here on the right. Very tragic event. So what this ultimately leads to is conscription or what we would call a peacetime draft. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the Havana Conference. I guess it's a little bit obscure, but I think it's important to bring in to the conversation for a number of different reasons. So as the Blitzkrieg rushes into the Low Countries in France in May of 1940, the Nazis just go around the Maginot Line, the defensive line that France planned to use to prevent an attack. America realizes very quickly that the only thing standing between the Nazis and Western Europe uh, is Great Britain. Obviously, FDR and a number of others, Democrats and Republicans, it's a, bit, it's a bit bipartisan if you think about it, also really depends on where they stand. If they want to start moving toward war prep, it wasn't like the way we see like a political divide in the New Deal issue, where like New Dealers were typically Democratic Democrats, right? and a lot of the anti-New Dealers were Republican. Well, as we shift into this era, the party, those party lines can tend to break down a little bit over the war, the preparation for war. So FDR called for America to build up the Army and the Navy. Congress appropriated $37 billion. It's a pretty big figure in a peacetime mobilization. And <coughs> The reason that a lot of the political line, party lines are kind of broken down, this is music to the ears of industrialists, right? They know that they're going to have to retool. And Secretary of War Henry Stenson said, the only way that this war effort is going to happen is for the government and the private sector industrial machine to come together and work together and make this build up occur. FDR in 39 appoints Lieutenant General George C. Marshall, BMI class in 1901. He'll be, become one of the five-star generals uh, by the end of the war. He is the Army Chief of Staff. So Marshall, Secretary of War Henry Stimson, Deputy Secretary of the War Robert B. P. Patterson, who will later serve as Secretary of War under Truman, uh, and Marshall, I already said Marshall, my apologies, they take on the task of, of mobilizing and preparing the country for war. As I said before, a number of historians, notably I talked about Tom Ricks, he just wrote a book, uh, it's a few years old now, The Generals, and they, he and a number of others would consider Marshall the best wartime military appointment during World War II. The peacetime draft is going to be instituted in September of 1940. This is America's first peacetime draft. This is going to train 1.2 million troops yearly, 80,000 reserves through the draft. But do keep in mind, you're probably thinking, wait a minute, those numbers don't make sense. If you have a combined military force of nearly 18 million, why is that number so low? That number is low because most people just did what once we were attacked? Yeah, they just volunteered, right? Like my grandfather, once Pearl Harbor was attacked, my grandfather shows up, he ate a bunch of bananas. He's a pretty tiny guy. He ate a bunch of bananas and put rocks in his pockets to weigh in to, to be able to enlist in the National Guard. I'm sorry. How would bananas factor into that? Because the he wanted he thought that, that they would help him weigh in more, so he ate so Did this, he not weigh in 
He did it. Yeah. yeah. He ate the bananas and he had the rocks in his pocket. Well, before the bananas and rocks. And it's kind of cool, like the little National Guard station is right down below the hill where my grandparents live. So just imagine him like running down there and, and um, sad enough to go into the National Guard. Um, we'll talk more about him later. So September 16th, 1940. Um, selective Training, Selective Service Act. How many of you guys have like physically signed up for Selective Service? Fellas. All right. You all will by the time, when you turn 18, you all will. Like I said last class, you have started that process, gentlemen. If you've gotten a license, if you've registered to vote, you are on the grid, right? You're already on the grid. You have a social security number, right? Well, it really depends on how, Graham brings up a really good point. Depending on the war, right, Civil War, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, they all had different conscription requirements. Like, in the Civil War, there were a laundry list of jobs you could do to get out of the draft. You could buy your way out of the draft, right? World War One, World War Two. if you're in college, if you're a teacher, if you do a number of different things, if you're a preacher or like a conscientious objector, maybe like a Quaker, but a lot of those people were, were ended up as medics or ended up serving in a different capacity. And this is also pretty interesting too, for the mobilization of war, the most famous athletes, the most famous actors, like all these people, they could not get away from the draft. So guys like Ted Williams, Joe DiMaggio, you think about, I'm, I'm a pretty big baseball fan, I know I've got some other baseball fans in here. Some of, Ted Williams is probably, not probably, he's one of the greatest hitters that ever played the game. He was a fighter pilot during his prime. When you, it's kind of crazy to think about. Joe Lewis, the boxer. Yeah. Joe DiMaggio. Mo Burr. He's a catcher for the Red Sox. He was worked for the OSS. He was a spy. Um, the, again, it's not just baseball players. Who was a spy? Mo Burr. Well, he was a catcher for the Red Sox, and he ended up getting recruited by the OSS. We'll talk about the OSS later. The OSS is our is our, our forerunner to the CIA. They're a clandestine group, and we get trained actually by the British and the Canadians at Camp X. I'll tell you another famous OSS operative was Julia Child. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I saw that on Drunk History. I'm sorry. Drunk History is Drunk History. Yes. I, 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 I want to keep my job, so we're not going to watch that, but they are pretty funny. Okay, I, I watched it with my parents. parents. Yeah. So I guess you could technically recommend an episode or two to us, but you can't sanction it and you can't show Correct. it. I can't, but, I can't show it in class. But so, a I mean, little bit about the Havana Conference. The Havana Conference was a meeting between... Western Hemisphere diplomats, nations in North and South America, came together to have a return to the Monroe Doctrine policy that if attacked in the Western Hemisphere or invaded, the United States would respond to that call of duty. So we see a number of, and we'll, we'll get into this later too, we'll see a number of Mexican, Mexican-American, Brazilian mobilization into the war, and also other Caribbean and Latin American countries as well that are going to serve, send people into service. So here we have George C. Marshall on the left. On the right, your selective service primary doc. I wish I, actually, I, wish I could find, I know it's somewhere, I wish I could find my selective service. I distinctly remember signing up for selective service and I don't know where the card is. There's George Hatlet Marshall and
and the selective service card. So mobilization for war, FDR and Secretary of War Henry Stetson. The number of different governmental organ organizations will probably be a bit staggering. So we'll get more into that during the war on the home front. One group I want to talk about in particular is one of the earliest ones formed, and that was the War Resources Board, the WRB established a plan to identify what would be needed to mobilize, and it was led by Stimson, Patterson, and Marshall. This leads to the Industrial Mobilization Plan, and the goal was large military contracts and industry would provide millions of new jobs and a colossal output of military supply. Industry has to be converted from war to war production from civilian production and it really takes some time from 39 to 41 to make this happen but companies like Ford Motor Company are going to retool for war. Willys Overland are going to produce the Jeep. Ford produces the Jeep for a while too. They get into the game a little bit later. So we're talking ships, tanks, arms, ammunition, warplanes, and that spending goes from 8.9 billion in 39 to over 95 billion in 45. Gross national product involves a real boost in the economy, 90 billion to nearly 212 billion. Unemployment drops below 2% by 1945. World War II pulls the United States out of the Great Depression. Because if you look at the statistics at the start of the war, unemployment is still in the teens. So war material, again, it, the numbers are staggering. 296,000 warplanes, 86,000 tanks, 64,000 landing craft that we talked about the Higgins boats in, produced in New Orleans. Uh, the guy that invented it, Andrew Jackson Higgins. We'll talk more about the Higgins boat as we talk when we get into the Pacific and D-Day in, in, in Europe. 6,000 naval vessels, millions of guns, billions of bullets, hundreds of thousands of trucks and jeeps made by Ford and Willys Overland. 18 million American service members, volunteers, draftees. This also includes women that became part of different organizations like the WACs, the Women's Army Corps, the WAVES. Any idea who the WAVES were? Sounds like a pan, that's all. Awesome. The waves. Were they our naval wives? They were the they were the women's navy corps. Oh, it was oh, uh, don't get the wasps. The wa the wasps, yeah. Yeah, they're the women's air corps. Yeah. You you already know my favorite group, but they were in America. Correct. Did you see I sent you that thing from a shepherd? I did, I had I did open it, but I'm gonna do that now. Cool, yeah. All right, so again, over 12 million American workers served on the home front. This is pretty wild. By 45, 14 million of those workers were unionized in one way, shape, or another. It's pretty nuts. On the, sure. On the left, we have Henry Stenson. There's Robert P. Patterson. And then a massive dip in unemployment, an increase in wages. Who talked about the wage, wage freezes? Did you talk about that? Yeah. So again, there are still labor disputes. Unions like United Miners, CIO, they, they're going to rise up during this era. And we'll talk about some of that pushback as we get into the home front. The destroyer deal. Britain was obviously on Hitler's list, 
to attack, and the attack on Britain required or air superiority. So the Nazi Luftwaffe began bombing in the Battle of Britain, cities like London and other major war production and large populated cities in England. The British Royal Air Force fought back, halted Germany in the world's first all-out air war. The Battle of Britain is more of a campaign because it's fought from July 10th to October 31st, 1940. We'll get more in depth about the Battle of Britain moving forward. Isolationists in America set up the America First Committee in September of 1940. Charles Lindbergh was their spokesman, and they outright supported the Nazis over Soviet communists. Yes, this was wildly controversial. And a lot of these people were flat out anti-Semitic. And the number of members is somewhere between 800,000 and 1.2 million. Yeah. Obviously, the America First Committee, the pro-Nazi committee in America, fell apart on December 8, 1941. Lindbergh deeply regretted being the spokesperson for this particular committee. I'll get to your question in a second. Do keep in mind, not all of the people in, the, in, the, in this group were anti-Semitic, but a lot were. Yes? Uh, so, uh, like the American First Committee, and uh, you know, other Nazis sympathizers, so what was their, their relationship with American big groups like the KKK? Because I know in the 20s, the KKK had like a million members. So, like, were they, like, so, Interesting, this is an interesting fact about the KKK. What led to the downfall of the KKK was the Depression and World War II. So they're actually, they're, they're on, the, on the downside. I have a pretty good feeling that what was left of the KKK and some members of this group were probably associated. A lot of it could have been contradictory though, because do remember that the KKK is also, they're anti-foreign, they're nativists, so they may, they may have attached themselves to this movement, but maybe not all of them were a part of it. Might want to take a look at that, see what, see what you can find. That would be sort of my, the way I would kind of look at it, because by the end of the war, the KKK is like all but gone, and then there's yet again another rebirth in the post-war era. Does that make sense? All right, cool. Well, I yeah, take a look. That'd be great. Thanks. Um, but I, I would, I think you hit the hammer of the head. There's got to be a connection, right? Um, so. Uh, interventionists, people that wanted to start mobilizing for war, set up the Committee to Defend the Allies. The destroyer deal was brokered on September 2nd, 1940. It, pre it was pressed by FDR. Um, America transferred 50 old destroyers, Caldwell, Wicks, and Clemson class destroyers from World War I in return for eight defensive bases in the Americas. That was from Newfoundland to South America. This is our early steps away from isolationism toward intervention, and FDR actually uses an executive order to issue the destroyer deal. Okay, I found out why they were not active during World War II. Apparently, um, they had so much scandal that they started to break off, and then they were busted for tax evasion. Mm -hmm. So they had to disband. After World War II, they re-congregated. Mm -hmm. I guess that's going to be the word. That's a good word. They re-congregated after um, they became an anti-communist platform. Right. And then in the South, it started to gather all the old members and recreate, which is not good. Right. I knew that they had a lot of economic scandal in the 
go run rolling into the depression era. In forty four there were officially four students that ended up the tax fraud. Right. And so many of their members or potential members were more concerned with the war effort or were actually fighting. This is a Battle of Britain Air Observer in nineteen forty. And we will dig into the events of this particular battle a little bit more in depth. I highly recommend, if you haven't already started, to start reading Chapter 2 in the story of World War II. America First. That's their symbol. There's Charles Lindbergh, their spokesman. And here on the right is a rally where Lindbergh is speaking on behalf of the organization. And then this is the HMS Stanley, former U.S. destroyer, transferred to Britain through the destroyer deal from September of 1940. So, Roosevelt is up for re-election. He is going to break the two-term tradition and run for a thir third term to be nominated by the Democratic Party. He runs against Indiana's Wendell Wilkie, a dark horse candidate, kind of came out of nowhere. Wilkie is going to criticize some of the New Deal mishandlings, but the biggest problem for Wilkie is that on foreign affairs, there wasn't a whole lot of difference between the two candidates, and FDR is going to run on this campaign slogan of better a third term than a third raider. Lincoln's old adage, do not change horses in midstream. And FDR promises not to send the boys to any foreign war, which does really haunt him, but he doesn't have much of a choice after the attack on Pearl Harbor. FDR wins big again, pretty lopsided, 449 to 82 in the Electoral College. He wins handling the popular vote as well. And here we have Wendell Wilkie on the left. The campaign button wings for Wilkie. I want Roosevelt again. And that just shows you the Electoral College breakdown. Yeah, um, that is for a couple of reasons. He is a Midwesterner, but also, if you look, that region was deeply committed to the, the Nye Committee, right? So they have a lot of, they got Gerald Nye has a lot of support out there, and they, a lot of those folks are staunch isolationists. They're not interested in getting involved in the war and intervening. So that's a good question. All right, so Lend-Lease, the Lend-Lease Act, probably the more controversial act of pre-war and really the entire war aid that the United States provided. England needs money. England is stretched pretty thin at this point, not only from the Battle of Britain, but where is England going to have to mobilize to, to hold her colonies, some of her most precious colonies? Yeah. You're on the right path. Actually, they lost their colonies in Asia, so they're, they are, they're going to have no choice but to work with America to regain control of those colonies. Yes, North Africa. England's going to have to mobilize to North Africa and battle Italy and ultimately the Nazi Africa Corps. So England needs war supply, and we're going to talk about both the, the uh, attacks on British colonies in Asia and British colonies in North Africa. So FDR's solution, loan weapons and ships to Britain in exchange for leases on what? When you think about lease, what do you do? What do you do? What's that? 
Like if you if you're going to go lease something, you pay it over time. Yeah. So what is a thing that you all might lease? Not yeah, a vehicle, right? We don't need the country doesn't need to lease a car. So what might they? A larger piece of property that they might be wanting to lease. Yes, bases, large scale chunks of land, something that the United States can reap the benefits from. Good job. So that's what the goal is here. Senator Robert Taft countered that lending tanks would be like lending bubble gum. So that was that was a FDR sort of like a fireside chat thing where FDR is like, well, you know, lend lease is like if your neighbor's house is on fire, are you going to let it burn or are you going to lend them a garden hose to put out the fire? Well, Taft says lend lease is like lending your neighbor a piece of gum. Once they've chewed it up, you don't want it back. He had a point there. But FDR is going to push this thing, and the lend lease bill will ultimately be passed by Congress and become the arsenal of democracy, as Roosevelt called it. By 1945, America had sent about $50 billion worth of arms and war material to the Allies. But not just arms and war material. We also sent what? Yes? Food? Aid? Yeah. yeah. Right. Everything from medical supply to food to oil to large-scale military production. So Lin Lee's marked an almost official abandonment of isolation involving aid to England, Russia, and China. Germany had avoided American ships up to this point, and on May 21st, 1941, a German sub destroyed an American ship, the Robin Moore. So on the top left, we've got the flow of Lend Lease. The bottom left, this is a, a really great Dr. Seuss. Happy birthday, by the way, Dr. Seuss. Uh, Dr. Seuss cartoon. It is encouraging how much of this drifts into British ports. So they're just dumping the war material, the U.S. Lend-Lease and Dunk Company. And then Lend-Lease Lend -Lease and Lend-Bill, American Aid to Britain, it's got Roosevelt, who's about to open up a floodgate, and that's Hitler and here's the other Nazis. I'm trying to think. Yeah. Take a closer look at that cartoon, see which high-ranking Nazis, because the guy over to the right there kind of looks like Goebbels, and they're probably, Guderian is probably in the mix there. I'll, I'll look back at that for us. So Hitler broke his non-aggression pact with Russia in June of 41, double-crossed Stalin. This becomes known as Operation Barbarossa. And in response, America is going to send a billion to Russia in help to defend Moscow. Germany makes quick and early gains. A lot of people thought that the Nazis would overrun the Soviets quickly. There are a number of reasons why they attacked. Number one, they want the, the foodstuffs the grain, the wheat, they want the petroleum in the Caucasus. There's a level of arrogance that Hitler has that he believes that this invasion will work, not understanding that he's going to spread his forces out way too thin. And another issue that needs to be addressed is the fact that the Nazi high command, mainly Hitler, is worried if he doesn't do it first, the Soviets will invade Germany or lands held by Germany. But the Nazi advance is going to be stopped not only by the Red Army, but also by the winter that sets in in 41, and Germans literally freeze 
at the gates of Moscow. We'll be talking about that entire front, siege of Leningrad, siege of Stalingrad, and fighting on the Eastern Front in Operation Barbarossa. Yeah. Um, I think one of the reasons uh, Hitler well, well put. I should have brought that up before. That's a really great point, Andrew. The Soviets got just completely destroyed in the Winter War against Finland. In fact, that's what Andrew's going to be doing research on. And it ultimately leads to like the death of hundreds of thousands of Russians and only like 20,000 Finns. So that gave Hitler a lot more confidence as well. So here we have Lynn Lease on the left, propaganda, aid to our allies. Here's Roosevelt meeting with foreign minister, Soviet foreign minister. You might know who that guy is. That is Molotov. I don't know, but that is Molotov. That is Molotov. He is the, he is the foreign minister to the Soviets. And what's that? Probably looks, not a fighter, but a, it is an airplane. Is that an aisle drum It is actually what would be sort of considered as like an American Tomcat, right? Yeah, I think it might be, because are you talking about the ground? I'm talking about the fact that that is an American aircraft that is provided to the Soviets through Lend-Lease. Yeah. You would know the exact make of the, of the plane more so than I would, though. Yeah. Um, is that guy up there for the Is he the one who the bomb truck in that? Yep, that's him. Molotov cocktail is named for that man. Please connect the two. Uh, the Molotov cocktail is a, a makeshift bomb that you basically fill, fill a, a bottle full of gasoline and you take a well soaked rag, shove it in the top, light the top of the rag, and then throw the glass bottle. That's a Molotov cocktail. How Again, a lot of this has to do with the Bolshevik Revolution and the use of these, these uh, particular cheap handheld bombs that could be made by anyone during the overthrow of the Russian Tsar. My guess is that someone just like threw it and was like, on top, and then I like that. So it was the Finns who saw these. Oh, well, that's what we're going to call that now. They're going to call it the Molotov cocktail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it dates back to World, they started using them in World War I. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's pretty cool. All right, so most of the Lend Lease material went to the UK. Next would be Russia and then other parts of the world North Africa, Middle East. India and China. Davis's uh, research on the Burma Road relates to Lend Lease in China and the air missions over the Himalayas. The Atlantic Charter was held on August 14, 1941, between Churchill and FDR in New Finland. The charter was formed basically to figure out what the main points of the war were, what the goals of the war were, were and what the goals of the war would be once the Allies had won the war. Stalin was not included in this meeting. He felt snubbed. We'll talk about later meetings with the Big Three in the Middle East and also in the Soviet Union and in Germany. Obviously, there would be some 14 points-esque language in the Atlantic Charter. No territorial or government changes without the people's vote, self-determination. Disarmament, disarmament and self-determination would be sought for 
colonies, even though we know that doesn't happen in the post-war era, which will lead to bigger problems like the Korean War and Vietnam and wars in the Middle East. New peacekeeping organization will be established like the League of Nations. This is going to be the forerunner to the UN, established and led by Secretary of State Cordell Hull that originally forms in 44. And then a lot of isolationists like Gerald Nye criticized the conference and charter, but again, America is no longer neutral. We are, we are moving toward the Allied side. This is the Atlantic Conference, the Atlantic Charter. Some important individuals in this picture. Prime Minister Winston Churchill, remember he replaces Neville Chamberlain in 1940. President Franklin D. Roosevelt and Army Chief of Staff George C. Marshall. So, U.S. destroyers and Carl, help me out, German students, Dunes? Did I say that? Dunes? Dunes? Um, what is that? What's the symbol that we're talking about here? No. Yeah. No. All right. So he is uh, the lead admiral in charge of the U boat wolf packs at the start of the war. Cities like New York, they didn't allow for blackouts because they thought it would hurt tourism. So FDR concluded that a convoy system would be used, merchant ships would be escorted by the United States warships to Iceland then the British would take over the escorting from there. Incidents happened, including German attacks on the American destroyer, the Greer, on September 4th, 1941. After the attack on the Greer, FDR declared a shoot on site policy, and then the destroyer, the Kearney, was attacked on October 11th, 1941, where 11 men were killed and the boat was damaged. And then the destroyer, the Reuben James, this is the big one, it was torpedoed by U-boat 552 and sunk off of Iceland, killing over 100 Americans on October 31st, 1941. In November of 41, as a result of the sinking of the Reuben James, Congress stopped pretending and pulled the plug on outdated neutrality laws and acts like the Neutrality Act of 39. Merchant ships would now arm themselves and would now enter combat zones. So here we have on the top left and the top right the Nazi U boat fleet or wolf packs, the Admiral Dunants here. In the center, this is the destroyer Reuben James that was sunk on October 31st. This is a uh, pretty interesting torpedoes found on American beaches that occurred on the East Coast and the West Coast. And then this is a political cartoon in remembrance of the sinking of the Reuben James. How are there torpedoes on the West Coast? Um, there, uh, there are some torpedoes found on the West Coast. There's also bombing raids in Oregon and in California that were launched by the, uh, the Japanese as well. Um, torpedoes found from Virginia Beach down to Florida. After the Reuben James blackouts are going to start to occur. Um, yeah, yeah, it was pretty wild. There's actually some, well, I've got the event, can't remember exactly what year, but one Nazi submarine was apprehended off the coast of Virginia Beach, and they were, and that, that particular sub essentially surrendered off the coast of Virginia. So there are Japanese missions running from the Aleutians to the 
Pacific Northwest, and there are Nazi wolf packs all along the Atlantic coast. Not where, uh, like uh, Outer Banks or? Cool. Not cool, but cool. All right, so the attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. <coughs> Operation Z. I think, Isaiah, you're doing Operation Z for your term. Don't confuse that with the Operation Z of 1944. That's a defensive plan to prevent a future attack on American islands that have been regained um, by the Americans and the Allies. So remember, Japan had, had invaded Manchuria and China. In re relation to that, America placed an embargo on oil and steel. This leads to the Prime Minister of Japan, Hideki Tojo, to push forth the plan known as Operation Z, also known in action as Operation AI. Um, and that is going to be the attack on Pearl Harbor. American and Dutch codebreakers knew the Japanese were up to no good, but they thought, as did FDR, that the attack would be in either British colonies, as Jack pointed out, talked about before, or American-controlled Philippines. Not to mention, I think Robin brought this up, the possibility of Guam. What are some other American land holdings out in the Pacific? Can I remember? What's that? Philippines. Philippines, Guam, America Samoa, true split with Britain, with Germany. It's awkward. Yeah, but I'm, we're thinking we do have control of Puerto Rico, but there are two other islands that are really important. One starts with a W, one starts with an M. Midway, very good. Midway. <coughs> and then the other one starts with a W. Called Wake Island. Good job. Wake Island. All right. So the attack comes at Pearl on the Sunday, Sunday morning, December 7th. Why a Sunday morning? Why would the Japanese want to attack you? Because People are in church. church. Very good. People are going to church. What else? Sleeping. People are sleeping in. Hungover from Saturday night. Hungover from Saturday night. These are all factors. Very true. Um, GIs, they like to party, right? Like, it, so. Yeah, it was their chill day. There were some exercise missions going on. Luckily for us, the carriers are out to sea on an exercise, and the Japanese are going to fly in, torpedo the, and bomb the ships that are at are docked at Pearl Harbor. So several ships were sunk or damaged, including the USS Arizona, which is now the monument to the attack on Pearl Harbor, the USS West Virginia. Nearly 3,000 Americans were missing, killed, wounded following the events. American aircraft carriers were out at sea. If they had been destroyed, the American naval situation would have been pretty hopeless in the Pacific. Here are images of the attack. This is uh, the attack on the on the West Virginia. Here we have ships that were attacked: West Virginia, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and Maryland. And what we're going to do is get a little bit more in depth on the events of Pearl Harbor when we first talk about the Pacific. And this is the memorial, which I would really like to visit. So, awesome. That's cool. Yeah. So, America enters the war on December 8th. We declare war on Japan on December 11th. Germany and Italy declare war on us. And now this is a global war. It's official. 
America is now transformed from bystander to belligerent. And what we move away from is obviously isolationism. The plans are now going to be set to figure out how this war is going to be won. The goal in Europe, defeat Hitler first. The goal in Pacific, island hopping closer to Japan, putting pressure on the islands and preventing Japan from gaining what massive piece of territory They already, they got the Philippines. They've invaded China. This is our, this is really our allied base of operations. They attacked Alaska and attacked the Aleutians. Can you point us in the right continent? You just, yes, I was gonna, yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to give it away by saying continent. Yeah, so Australia. We're fearful that they're going to launch an attack on Australia. So we'll talk, we'll talk about island hopping as we move forward. This is from the Virginia Pilot and the New York World Telegram. Japan attacks U.S. ships, planes, bases, 1,500 dead in Hawaii. And then this is Roosevelt signing the Declaration of War. A day which will live in infamy. We'll check out the Roosevelt speech. And then Japan declares war on the US. Just wanted to show you a few primary docs. So here's what we got, our allied powers. The big three, the US, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union. You guys got any questions for me? We'll be talking about our different theaters of war. Europe, Asia, North Africa. And that...